Hello everybody, I'm Nicolas Boquet from Leadex Pro and I will present you how we implemented the biophysical tools and more particularly the wave delta instruments in our workflow. But before I come to this point, I would like to take the chance to first introduce Leadex Pro and what we are currently doing. So as an outline of the presentation, uh, I will just walk you through uh, what is Leadex Pro about. Uh, a short, very short introduction of, of this company and how we use the wave delta system in our structural biology pipeline. I will give you although an example of uh, how we use it actually in a concrete example on a project and how we selected some nanobodies which are uh, stabilizing a conformational, um, um, conformational uh, state of uh, GPCR. And at the end of the presentation, or in a second part, I would uh, focus on the uh, wave rapid, uh, new techniques that Cryptix developed. Uh, first, to compare how it compares with the old way of recording data, as well as a screen that we perform with this new uh, technique. So first, uh, what is Lydix Pro? So Lydix Pro is a company which has been founded in 2015 and which is financed by private investors. We are a spin-out of the Porcher Institute, and we are focused on uh, structure-based drug design on membrane proteins. So we are working only on membrane proteins, ion channels, GPCRs, uh, transporters, and also enzymes. We are utilizing pioneering technology, such as uh, FEL free electron laser for X-ray crystallography, as well as cryo-EM, so electron microscopy, for determining the structural um, information of membrane proteins. Uh, we are actually really trying to leverage any structural information um, on very important drug and on very important drug targets. So this is how the Lydix for platform, if you wish, is looking like. So we are solving structures of membrane protein. For that, we need, of course, a full pipeline from expression of the protein um, in many different systems, bacterial, insect cells, as well as mammalian cells, to protein purification, of course. We are trying to really uh, purify as good as we can in the best condition, the proteins. And of course, we need to um, characterize the binders to these proteins to really ensure that the protein is active and that we are really going to crystallize or to uh, make the structure of what we are interested in. And at the end of the pipeline, if you wish, uh, we have the structural determination part where um, we use crystallography, traditional crystallography, serial crystallography, as well as free electron laser crystallography, as well as cryon electron microscopy to determine the structure of the complexes between the membrane protein targets and the binder of interest which can be a small molecule or a biologic. But more um, if we want to focus on the uh, binder part, so for us it's very important to really characterize the binder properties. Uh, it's involved in all the aspects of the work we are doing. So that's why we were really willing to implement a biophysical tool allowing us to, to characterize these binders all the way through. So from the very beginning, where we need to uh, quality control the protein or the purified sample we have, but although for screening purposes, so membrane protein can bind the binder in, in one condition, but not in the other. For example, in specific detergents. So we need to screen for that. And of course, I mean, it's uh, very important for us to be able to do so. But it's also supporting our structural effort. For example, we when we have a lot of different ligands, we need to rank them and to prioritize them. Uh, for example, for the nanobodies, we need to know what they are actually doing to the, to the protein. Are they stabilizing in one conformation? Uh, how good they bind to the, to the protein and, and so on. So it's very important for us. Uh, it's also important to be able to, be, uh, to, to screen uh, for ligands through fragment-based library, for example, or to screen small molecules, peptides, or biologics. And we are also very, um, very keen in understanding um, the mechanistic behind the binding of a molecule. So we really want to make a detailed characterization of the, of the small molecules, 
but although we want to understand if we have an allosteric ligands, uh, how it affects the autosteric binding of the molecule. We although want to be able to do competition essay or mutational analysis and really deep understanding of the mechanistic of binding. So for that, uh, we came uh, to choose the cryoptic uh, instrument, so the wave delta, um, and for three different or different and main reasons. So first of all, uh, we evaluated the sensitivity of the instrument, and actually uh, the sensitivity turns out to be extremely high. We were able to really record weak binder of very small size. For example, in this graph on the left, you can see a binder which is double digit micromolar on the GPCR, and we were really able to still record the, the kinetic data of, of this compound. So in addition of that, uh, we can acquire data at 40 Hertz, which is uh, always very nice for very um, weak binders with very fast K-off. Uh, and it opens up fragment screening on membrane proteins. For us, sensitivity is a really a crucial point because when we purify a membrane protein, the percentage of activity is never super high and we really need sensitivity. But there are a couple of other features of this instrument which are although very great for us. Um, for example, in the middle of the slide, you can see the robustness for crude lysate analysis. So that means we, we can actually work with non-purified sample. And this is quite important for us because it saves time when we try to uh, screen for condition of solubilization of membrane protein, for example. So it really opens up the way for detergent buffer screening and early check on protein functionality. And then of course, which uh, one important point as well for this presentation is the new development of the wave rapid combined to automated and flexible software. So this is, as I will uh, present you, so I don't spend too much time here uh, in the second part of the presentation, uh, that allows us to increase our lab productivity. So first of all, I would like to show an example of what we are really doing uh, at EDX Pro. So for example, here it's, an exa uh, it's a project where we wanted to actually search for an agonist conformation stabilizer. That's a GPCR project. And in that case, we want to crystallize it in the agonist conformation. For that, we raised nanobodies. And of course, um, the question was, uh, how do we screen for them? So we came up with a setup where we actually were able to screen the nanobodies against two different conformations of this same GPCR. So that's two sets of experiments. So one screen has been performed on the agonist stabilized receptor on the left, and one set of experiments has been done on the antagonist stabilized GPCR. So we screen on these two different setups the same set of, of different nanobodies. And the key parameter here that we are monitoring was the chaos. So if a nanobody would bind better to the agonist conformation, usually the chaos is slower than uh, if it binds less good on the antagonist conformation. So that's what we are looking for. And here it's plot, so histogram plot, where we actually see where the binders have a tenfold potential affinity better on agonist conf uh, conformation to, um, compared to the antagonist conformation. And with this plot, we can actually select the best binders or the potentially best binders um, in order to actually um, make a detailed characterization of them later on. Because of course, that was too much nanobodies to really do that in the first place. We needed to screen first. Here it's a K on K of plot of the best binder we selected. Um, and that's the affinities and the kinetic data recorded on the antagonist stabilized receptor. So not much to say. We have a great diversity of, uh, of kinetic here uh, with some with better affinities, so lower than 10 nanomolar, um, and some which were a bit less good. But most importantly, we wanted to do the same characterization on the agonist stabilized conformation. So the idea here is to really detect the binders which are, have a better affinity towards the agonist. 
which is represented here. So now that's the same nanobodies, but um, recorded against the agonist stabilized receptor. And as you can see, you have a shift of affinities for some of them. So you have, let's say, three different families, the nanobodies with tenfold more uh, affinity towards the agonists, which are in green. In orange, that's between two and 10. And in red, you have the nanobodies where you do not see any difference in affinities towards the agonist or the antagonist conformation. So that was a very good sign for us to really detect and focus the nanobodies which have better chance to stabilize the agonist conformation. And to confirm that, uh, we did a G-protein coupling impairment experiment. So what is this is actually most of the case where the nanobodies are stabilizing the, the agonist conformation, they take the place of the G-protein. So the G-protein is actually binding uh, at the bottom of the GPCR and is stabilizing the agonist conformation. So a great um, nanobody would actually take the position of the G-protein and stabilize the agonist conformation. To check that, we actually did this essay where we immobilize the G-protein on the chip and we come with a GPCR, which is in presence of agonist, as well as the different cybodies that we have selected from the previous slide. And of course, if the cybody is taking the place of the G-protein, it wouldn't bind so well to the G-protein coated chip. While when the cybody is uh, binding to a different place, then it's able to bind as the normal receptor without any nanobodies uh, on the chip. And that's what you can see here. So on the left, the bar on the left is actually the receptor alone, so without uh, any nanobodies incubated before. And that's a basic level of attachment you can achieve with this um, uh, receptor. And then you have the, all the different selected uh, nanobodies. So some are not impairing the, the binding to the G protein and some are. So the, when you have a low level of attachment, that means the nanobodies is most likely to take the place of the G protein. And just to make this story short, uh, so we have a couple of them which were actually competitive with the G-protein binding sites. And for example, the nanobody 14, which uh, is highlighted in green here, um, was able to actually co-crystallize with the protein. And that was the successful one, let's say, where we could achieve um, uh, X-ray structure in the agonist conformation. So now we'll switch to the uh, wave rapid uh, technique. So first of all, when it came up, we started to use it in September, something like this. And uh, first, what we wanted to do is to compare with the MCK, so multiple cycle kinetics. So that was the classical way we were recording um, data, let's say. Uh, and to compare that to the wave rapid, of course, to see if the data would compare and would be in good agreement. So that would be the first point that I would like to show. And then I will finish the presentation by an example of a screen we perform on a GPCR and on 42 peptides. So first of all here, what you can see is, um, so we selected two projects. One project, which is an SLC transporter and where we have nanobody binders, very well characterized. And we took all of this binder and we compare the wave rapid way uh, as the traditional way, as we were using before. Uh, the, it's just an example here of one, and you can see on top the wave rapid traces, and at the bottom you can see the multiple cycle kinetic measurements. And as you can see on the left example, so on the SLC transporter, you can see very high agreement, so the data were very nice, and they were really in high agreement. On the right you see the same, but on the GPCR, and that's a recording of small molecule binding. And again, we can see a very high uh, agreement. The KD are very similar, um, and we were very happy about that because, I mean, of course, it means that it's very consistent to the way we were recording data before. And here, just the same experiment, but with a bit more binders. So on the left, again, you have the SLC transporter with different nanobodies. On the right, you have the small molecule with a GPCR, and on each graph, you can see in blue, uh, so the dots in blue are representing the wave rapid measurements and the black dots are representing the MCK uh, recording. And as you can see, we can 
we can say that we have a very high agreement between MCK and wave rapid measurements. Uh, we have a, even a better correlation uh, with dots which are very close to each other for the nanobodies uh, on the SSC transporter. So they were giving the almost the same affinity measures as well as the same kinetic measures. So that was very um, ensuring and very, uh, um, very nice to see that. So based on that, uh, we engage in a, in a screen. So, and that's the last example I would like to, to show. That's a screen of peptides on the APO GPCR. So here, what you can see on the dots, it's again the K-on-K-off plot where we represent all the different peptides we measured with a wave rapid. And the point I want to make here is that actually this uh, wave rapid uh, technique is really nice in a way that we can combine primary and secondary screen. Before that, we were actually um, we are doing a first screen, primary screen, where we were injecting only one concentration, one or two injections of, of, of the binders to try to focus and narrow down the numbers of, of binders we are wanting to test later on. Now with this wave rapid, we can actually just get all the data we want, so kinetic data, K on, K off, and KD affinities uh, in one shot. That's actually what is shown here. So for example, if you would like to immediately select for K off, for example, which is represented by this uh, green bar, um, if you would like the best K-off uh, or the slowest K-off uh, peptides, here it is, you can immediately see it after one experiment, and the graph is showing you the type of data we, we got for that. Same if you would like to have the best K-on, for example, if you are selecting toward the K-on, that's very easy as well. I mean, with the same set of experiments, you can actually do it uh, right away. Uh, here again, I mean the two best examples, for example, of the best K-on um, compounds. And here that's a full picture of the screen, so where we can actually plot after one experiment all the different uh, affinities of the peptides we, we got. And immediately you see uh, different families of peptides where we have the first priority hits, which are of course the best binders. Uh, and although some priority hits, and so on and so on. So we can really classify them very quickly and very accurately. So here, that's the conclusion slides to try to raise some points about the comparison between um, the MCK way of recording data, if you wish, and the wave rapid method. So here it's a comparison of time that has been spent on setting up the experiments, as well as running it on the machine you have to see that that's a comparison to reach the same level of information. So we want to have the K on, the K off, as well as the affinities. For that, in the traditional MCK, you would have to do, first at the preparation stage, you would have to do serial dilutions of all the different compounds, which is actually time consuming compared to the wave rapid, where you use only one stock of the, uh, of the compound. Uh, and although one very important point is that the space that you have on the rack, if, of course, if you do eight different dilutions of each compound, uh, you cannot screen 42 compounds in one go, while with a wave rapid you can. And although affecting the measurement time like tremendously, so I was very astonished to see the difference. So that's a rough calculation, but for the wave rapid run for this peptide screen, it was in total 12 hours and a half for one run, and we got all the information we wanted. If you would have used a traditional MCK, and if you would have to really measure accurately all the, the parameters, you would have to do three successive experiments because of this space problem on the rack uh, that you cannot measure all of them in one go. Uh, so first, you have to assume that your protein will be stable for three different successive experiments, which is not always given for membrane proteins. And that would represent approximately, approximately 70 hours of experiment on the machine. So you have a factor of six, let's say. Uh, so six times faster for the wave rapid compared to the traditional MCK. And although one very important point is that you consume much less reagent. So for example, for this wave rapid uh, experiment, this screen, I used 250 ml of buffer while for the traditional MCK, I would have to, to set up three different experiments, and that's close to one liter of buffer. That doesn't sound much, but for us, it's very important because 
in the reagents and in the renin buffer, we have very uh, expensive um, reagents sometimes, so like detergents, or sometimes we put compounds in, in the running buffer. And of course, if you can minimize that, I mean, it's always helpful. So this is, was for the time-saving part, which is um, very important for us. So that allows us to really uh, improve our lab productivity. But although, as I show you with the last example, that allows us to combine the primary and secondary screen. So in one go, we get the, all the kinetic data, K on, K off, and K this for all the compounds. And um, combined to the software that uh, Cryptics has developed, we have also a better assessment of what it is that you can have sometimes, especially for weak binders in the association curves, for example. So all together, that gives us a very nice, fast, and reliable uh, system to really assess all the different binders we might have on, them, on membrane proteins. Thank you very much.